Uh, and thank you, the American Farrier Journal and 3M Products for uh, making this happen. Uh, the title of my presentation is Suing the Show Hunter and Jumper in Wellington, Florida. And the objectives tonight are to give you some sense of the Wellington experience. Uh, there is, this is the most uh, unique place in, in the world in terms of the concentration of good horses, good farriers, good vets, and, and a lot of money. We're going to be showing you some of the top uh, rigs the farriers use, uh, the shoes they use, and some of the innovative ideas of the, their businesses. Uh, what I've done the last few days is I've been able to uh, go around and visit a lot of the top farriers in the, in the area. They've allowed me to uh, interview them and to take all kinds of pictures, and it's been a great, great experience. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of a geography lesson here. Um, Wellington, Florida is located in southeast United States. Uh, in the southern part of Florida, we're about 65 miles north of uh, Miami, about 10 miles west of West Palm Beach is one of the most uh, wealthiest communities in the, in the, in the nation. Uh, this is a tropical climate, and so during the wintertime, January, February, the temperatures are in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, I first came to this area in 1988. At that point, the Wellington Equestrian Festival was uh, in its third year. Uh, Wellington at that point was uh, a pop, had a population of 10,000. On the way out from uh, the West Palm Beach uh, Airport, uh, this is all you saw. It was uh, totally undeveloped, all this, this scrub land on, on both sides of the road. Uh, the houses in Wellington was uh, it's a modest little community. Uh, the population were all very, very laid back. In fact, uh, Wellington is known for its large Muscovy duck population. There are probably more ducks here in 88 than there were horses. Now we're going to fast forward to 2013, and all of that has changed. The population of Wellington is now about 55,000. Uh, on either side of the road, you will see all of these uh, gated communities with these lavish entrances. And a good part of this has been due to the horses, uh, and especially the uh, uh, Winter Equestrian Festival. Uh, beginning in about in uh, Thanksgiving, there was a migration south to Florida here from the, uh, the, the Midwest and in the, the east. Uh, about 6,000 hunters and jumpers will, uh, will come to the area. Uh, beginning in the first week in January, they will show for 16 weeks. Those 6,000 horses are worth over a billion dollars. will be showing for prize money of over three million and it will, they will perform before 250,000 spectators. In addition to all the hunters and jumpers, the dressage horses have their own circuit here, as well as the high goal polo players. This is the, uh, the mecca for, for polo in the winners for, for the high goal players from all over the world. So with all of these people and all of these horses, the total economic impact of Wellington is estimated to be $100 million. This is the showgrounds, kind of the epicenter of all the activity. Uh, the international ring is in the very center. It's about uh, three football fields uh, big. Uh, it has 12 rings that show continuously when, when the, the show is in full operation. Ten schooling rings, uh, four permanent barns, uh, 12, 12 tents. That area to the, to the top of the screen says private property is, uh, is all uh, private uh, uh, stables, uh, one more gorgeous than the other. We're going to look at those in just a little bit. Uh, this is one of the this is the very first permanent building on the on the showgrounds. Uh, this is the spectator entrance. What we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a tour of the grounds. This is one of the four permanent barns. Each of these have uh, 80 stalls. Uh, there are currently 10 tents in the ground. Each of these tents hold about uh, 100 horses each. Uh, they they go to uh, quite a bit of expense at time, making it very nice and homey. Uh, there's all kinds of activity on the ground. There are uh, probably 20 or 30 shops selling all kinds of different stuff. Uh, we have our own train service here, a little zoo, uh, numerous restaurants. Uh, there's a school on the ground, as well as a, the horse spa, and uh, the wash rack. This is uh, one of the reasons the farriers here are so busy, uh, but with the heat and humidity and, and the continued washing of the horses, the horses' feet grow very, very fast. Uh, this is a uh, view of the, the Grand Hunter ring, uh, typical uh, hunter fences. Uh, this is the caliber of horses that, that come here. This is Scott Stewart. 
on one of his really, really nice horses. Um, footing used to be an issue here. Uh, years ago when the, 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 the original rings were put in, they were, they were grass and uh, they would get chewed up and then the horses would have to be set it up sometimes pretty high. And uh, it does all change now. These are all permanent rings now and what they call all weather rings and this is a synthetic footing. And so these, this will pack down and, and so uh, the issue is now going from not enough traction to having too much. And so a lot of the shoeing that we'll be seeing here is to uh, sometimes lessen the traction, that even the jumpers now uh, routinely go without studs. This is the famous bridge uh, that is the entrance to the uh, Grand Prix field. Um, most of the famous jumpers in the world have come under this bridge at one time or another. Uh, here we are looking over at a, at a jump course. Um, and a view from the from the bridge, and one to the other side of the schooling rings. Uh, it used to be that uh, Saturday afternoon was the uh, the day of the big classes. Uh, they have now installed lights, and so uh, the big class right now is on Saturday night. Uh, uh, it's kind of a circus atmosphere. They get all kinds of people here, and uh, it, uh, it it's a lot of fun. If you like horses, uh, the horse show grounds is like it's a big park. They've got all kinds of horses here from, from steel horses to plastic colorful horses to bronze horses to living green horses, the ones that go around in circles and ones that look at themselves and ones that spit water and even the old naked white guys. Now this used to be a real common sight on the show grounds. Uh, a farrier's truck all over the trucks all over the place. Uh, this has changed in recent years where a lot of the uh, uh, residents have uh, built their own barns on the perimeter of the, of the showgrounds. It used to be that you could go to the showgrounds and have 12 or 15 farriers working and you could virtually get a, a, see a shoeing clinic every day. Uh, now with everybody having moved off the grounds, uh, or most people moving off the grounds, uh, it's, it's much, much harder to see the, the farriers at work. Uh, simply because a lot, a lot of the barns are now behind closed gates. This is an entrance to a, to a horse. Uh, uh, subdivision, uh, typical palm trees they have down here. Uh, there's almost a little bit of a competition down here to see who can build the, some of the most lavish barns. Uh, some of them get quite large. Uh, we're talking millions and millions and billions of dollars for some of these places. We are very fortunate to have two very good ferry supply businesses here in the area. The first is Bisbee's. They've been around for about 35 years. It is owned and operated by Jeff and Grace Gardner. And they have a huge inventory. They have just about every kind of shoe you could think of to shoe just about any kind of horse. They also sponsor several clinics a year. Uh, this is Billy Reed from South Carolina giving a forging demonstration. And then uh, this is Mike Wildenstein. He was here this past year, uh, year and uh, gave a great talk. And they also sponsor a nice sit-down dinner where it's a great place to socialize and, and learn from your fellow farriers. And then there's Palm Beach Farrier Supply. It is run by Joy Ream and Rick Heron, and they also have a very big supply. Uh, she also puts on a, a breakfast uh, once a month and has, shoot, has clinics down here, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of stay in touch with everybody. I asked her what, uh, what shoes are kind of going out the doors that you're selling most, and she says as far as the aluminum shoes, the, the Kirkhart Century Support is still probably the number one seller. Uh, followed by the Victory Venter, the Mustad Equilibrium, and the Kirkhart Comfort. Um, in, in my watching these guys, I saw I didn't see any Victory or, or Mustad shoes put on. It was uh, it was totally a Kirkhart experience. Uh, the uh, the uh, the Mustad Equilibrium is down there in the lower left. It has a, a roll toe as as well as the Comfort shoe. We're starting to see more of these shoes in, in use down here. Uh, the jumpers primarily all all go in steel. Uh, the Kirkhart DF 10 millimeter uh, is, as Joy said, is, is one of the most popular. And on the hind feet, they use the DF Select hinds, also in 10 millimeter. Uh, I saw also a lot of the Kirkhart SX8s, uh, front end hinds, as well as the Kirkhart Classic rollers. And uh, some people like the, the Classic supports. And the ACR shoes are uh, starting to make an appearance. Now, the ACR shoes are a French hybrid. Uh, they use a uh, different alloy aluminum than we do here, and, and so uh, you can actually burn the shoe on. Uh, the shoe in the bottom left is what's called the full roller, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, this is a quote from my good friend Don Later that trimming and chewing sport horses are not terribly complicated. 
but you have to be terribly precise. Uh, there's not much room for error down here and uh, not much forgiveness. I'm, I'm not going to talk very much about the, the, the actually the trimming and, uh, and the fitting of the shoes. Um, um, you have to come up to the summit for that. Uh, but the basics are the trim to the junction of the wall, the thick live sole, uh, the palmer angle should be three to five degrees from the ground, the wings of the coffin bone should be horizontal to the ground, and, and take all flares and deviations to the same plane as the upper part of the foot. Uh, when I say palmer angle, what I mean is the uh, is that distal edge of the coffin bone. Uh, we want that three to five degrees. One of the things that I saw down here, uh, there are almost as many farrier or veterinarians as there are farriers. Uh, this is a this is the best way of determining exactly what you have inside that foot as far as determining palmer angles. I do not particularly approve of this technique. You can see the one foot is on the block and the other one is uh, is on the ground. This is a much, much better technique, a much more farrier-friendly uh, views. Uh, if, uh, what I did is I, I built uh, some, some blocks for my, my vet back home, and uh, you may have to do that yourself. But this, this is the way to set a, a horse up for, for taking radiographs of, uh, of, of what we need. Um, all of the machines down here I saw are, are, are digital, and so you get an instant readout. Um, I also saw them taking pick, uh, laterals of the hind feet, and I thought that was kind of a waste of time until I saw the results, and I was absolutely amazed at the number of negative palmer angles in hind feet. Uh, even with this horse here, that I, I thought that he would have a have a really really good uh, palmer angle, and I was totally surprised. And, and so I've kind of uh, changed my mind on, on on this whole issue. That when you're, if you have the access and you're shoeing high end horses, I strongly recommend that you you get you of, of all four feet. Um, fundamentals to shoeing, uh, the toe of the shoe should be the same distance from the center of rotation as the heels. Uh, the center of rotation is found at the widest part of the foot. Uh, the toe of the shoe may have to be blunted and set back. Uh, you will not see many pointy-toed shoes around here. And the heels of the shoe should be sufficiently long and wide to protect the heels and give adequate support. This is all very, very basic shoeing. Uh, most of the horses here are, are shod with open-heeled shoes, and uh, it's, it's uh, not rocket science shoeing these horses. Uh, I'd like to kind of uh, pay tribute to some of the, the guys that I, I knew from, from years ago. One is Cappy Kaplan, who was an official sh uh, show carrier here for a number of years and actually started the horse show. Every year a trophy is awarded uh, in, in his honor. And the horse show puts on a really nice uh, dinner for us guys, and we all get dressed up, and we get to go down to the, to the ring and uh, present the trophy and uh, and make faces, and it's a it's a great time for the farriers down here. Uh, this is my uh, one of my early mentors, Seamus Brady. He has probably done more for the advancement of, of quality shoeing and hunters and jumpers than any other person. Really, a great great guy. And good old Jack Miller. We lost Jack a couple of years ago. Uh, universally loved, and we miss him dearly. Here he is with Sandy Johnson and Fran Yerga. And we get into some of the current guys and what they do. One is Greg Biting and uh, his uh, associate, Bo Johnson. Uh, Greg is on the right. He's from uh, Cincinnati or uh, Ohio. And uh, this is the, the typical of the rigs that we saw down here uh, 10 years ago. This is a Stonewell body. Uh, you can kind of see this is kind of a kind of a typical setup with the uh, inventory. Then they, they work out of the back, and uh, typical drilling and tapping setup. This is a, a kind of a nifty idea that uh, that Greg has. That he's got this uh, little kind of a, a shelter that you can kind of get out of the weather and uh, and stay protected a little bit. And uh, he also has one of the widest uh, grinding belts I saw down here with the, with the old jet grinder. And uh, this is a standard fare for down here with the drilling and tapping setup and uh, and the grinders. Sid Bundy is uh, one of the fixtures here in, in this area. Sid recently just turned 80. We had a uh, uh, birthday party for him, and you can see we uh, shared no expense in buying expensive uh, gifts. He works out of this uh, this panel truck. Uh, some people said this is the second truck of his whole shoeing career. That he is a uh, very frugal and uh, and makes things last. That uh, I caught him working in in the tents. This is typical of, uh, of, of what it's like in the, in the tents. You've got about uh, five feet or so in the, in, uh, be between the stalls, and that's why a lot of the people have moved off uh, off site for it's a long it's a long 16 weeks of your horse has to stay in one of these tents for the entire uh, season. Uh, this is a future five anvil. 
or Future 3 that, uh, that Sid uses, a very, very compact, efficient little, little setup he has here, there. as well as his old uh, slide-out rig that he's had this uh, thing forever, and uh, he can do just about anything out of this thing. We're going to be seeing a lot of leather pads uh, in, in this uh, little presentation. I did not see a single plastic pad put on the entire time I was here. Uh, as with these guys, it was entirely uh, uh, leather. Uh, this is Sid's uh, method of, uh, of his packing. This is uh, reducing uh, with, with oakum, and uh, he's used this system for a number of years, and uh, he totally swears by it. Uh, Curtis Burns lives right here in, in Wellington. This is with his uh, wife, Diane. Kurt comes to us, Curtis comes to us by way of the racetrack. He shod uh, a number of, of, of high-end high, uh, high end racing horses before he became, uh, came to the sport horse industry. He makes and manufactures uh, the uh, Polyflex shoe, which is a uh, totally glue-on shoe. And the thing about the Polyflex shoe is when you put it on, it, uh, it will flex normally like a, like a, like a barefoot um, foot. And, uh, and it's not tied in like, a, uh, and the heels are not tied in like you normally would have with, a, with an aluminum shoe. This is one of his really nifty ideas as far as cleaning up the bottom of the foot is to use this, uh, this portable drill and, uh, and, this, and this wire brush. He also has, uh, found this uh, moisture meter at the, uh, at the hardware store. Uh, having a dry foot is, is absolutely essential to a, to a good gluing job, and so um, you can actually uh, test the, the foot now for, uh, for moisture content and make sure that it's absolutely dry. Here he is uh, with, with one of the glue-on shoes. These, these shoes are really, really light and, uh, and very, very durable. You can use them both front and hind, and uh, you're starting to see more and more of this. Uh, Curtis finishes up his shoes with this uh, rotary drum sander, does a beautiful, beautiful job, as well as uh, getting the foot absolutely clean. And this is his finished foot, ready to go. Dave and Jay Farley have our old fixtures here. They have a very, very close relationship being father and son. Uh, Dave is uh, totally in charge of his business, where he, shot, he shoots his horses every four weeks. And what he does is he gets them all done in, in two weeks. And then the other two weeks, uh, Jay goes home to his family in Ohio, and, and, and Dave uh, takes care of any emergencies and, uh, and kind of hangs out. Here he is at, at work. And uh, I took this picture the other day. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm kind of getting into some of these fancy pictures. Uh, Jay is one of the fastest and the best clinchers on the, on the ground, as well as being a uh, magician at the grinding wheel. Uh, I caught them this, uh, working in a, it was a 40 horse barn, absolutely gorgeous place. This is uh, somewhat typical of the barns we're going to be, be seeing. Uh, they have used to have one of the largest trucks on the, on the grounds. Uh, this, since, I think he's since sold this truck, but you can see how, uh, how nice it is to, to work out of this. It's fully set up, it's really, really a nice truck. He has since uh, in the, sold it, and he's actually gone to one of the smallest little rigs on the on the on the grounds. That we're going to be seeing more and more of these trailers. These are becoming more and more common uh, with uh, restrictions of, of the big vehicles in Wellington. A lot of the farriers now are, are are pulling these these nifty little trailers. Now he's got everything in this trailer that he had in the, in the big truck. Um, one of the things that impressed me is that in the very nose of the trailer, the, he doesn't have very uh, much room, so he's got the uh, refrigerator in there and the uh, and the LP tank, and so what they do is they, they you start, use these narrow little shoot boxes um, that I've, I've been seeing that uh, more and more popular. Uh, they don't take up much room, and uh, they're really really handy and, and stable to use. Uh, it's hard to identify a lot of the work because uh, the shoes are so centered. But Dave is one of the two guys that has his own own stamp, and so he uh, identifies his work. This uh, fitting tong is made by Roy Bloom, and it's uh, it's a very unusual one. Here it is. They were using it with a with a shoe. It also comes with a. This is a quarter inch thick aluminum or a steel plate. And the reason uh, for it is that some of these horses that you're going to put alum, uh, aluminum shoes on, and you can't burn a shoe on. What you can do is you can take this plate, and you can actually hot seat that foot, close those tubules up, and so during the shoeing cycle, that that foot is going to stay in a, in, in, in much better shape and, and be a lot tougher than than if you hadn't done this. It's a really really good idea. Uh, the Baldor grinders are, have taken over as, as tar, far as a grinder of choice. Uh, this one is, uh, is uh, sold by FPD. It's a half horse and uh, has, has more power than you can imagine. Um, they are, some of them are, they're all set up 
a little bit differently. This one here has a, a 10 inch uh, expander wheel on the left, 6 inch on the right. Uh, generally 40 grit uh, ceramic uh, discs are, or belts are used and uh, you can use them for steel, aluminum pads and uh, very, very durable. Uh, this is becoming also very, very popular as little handheld uh, Makita uh, drills. Um, what you want to do is you want to equip it with, this is a, uh, a flexible uh, shaft on here. Uh, you can buy these at Home Depot and that will keep you from, from breaking your taps. Dave is very much a, uh, a DF guy. He uses the 22 by 10s in front and uh, the, the selects behind and uh, the comfort shoes for his, his hunters. Uh, this is a comfort shoe here with a, with a bar wedge pad. Um, you, we're going to be seeing all different kinds of pads. This is a, what they call a, a French pad here. It's a protective sole and if you have a frog that you want to keep it, uh, that's a little tender or you want to medicate it, it allows you to do that. This is the, the finished version here. Uh, this is typical of, uh, of, of Dave's hind shoes. But we're going to be seeing a different uh, look on, on the toes of these things. Some, some people round them up a little bit more. Some people have them a little blunder. Uh, some people do fancier things with the heels. Uh, and, and some do. Dave's is, is, uh, is, is kind of middle of the road here. You also notice the fact that there's only four nail holes in the, or in the, the, on that right sh shoe. That is typical of the way Dave's shoes his horses with only four nails. And uh, he keeps them on. Uh, this is a typical of the finish job you're going to be seeing down here. Uh, a lot of finish on these shoes. And uh, this is an example of, uh, of, of what I told you about trying to uh, lessen the traction. And this is the, the comfort shoe that has a little bit of a roll toe. On this particular horse, it's a little bit of a, of a long toe, low heel horse. Um, that had a little bit of a stumbling problem. So he also rockered that toe up. You can kind of see how that really, really moves that brake over back, and uh, you get a lot of mechanics in these, and they see you doing that. He also has a really nifty idea for, for hospital plates. Uh, this is a one-bolt hospital plate, uh, and so you don't have any, any little bolts protruding on the bottom. You can take in, you, if you have this on a horse and you see sound enough, you can ride him in this, and very easy to get on off of just that one bolt. Uh, Dave, thanks for everybody, even the dogs, and he's got, I, I like this license plate. I'd like to have, have that one. Uh, this is another thing that, that Dave has in the truck. He said he, he doesn't use it that much on the show horses, but occasionally um, you'll, you'll, you'll come across a horse that really, really has arthritic cocks. You can't lift that hind leg but, but a few inches off the ground. And it's very, very difficult to use a nipper and a, and a rasp on these things. And so you can use this little uh, Makita 12-volt uh, or 18-volt uh, hand grinder with the uh, it's a flap disc. You can do a pretty good job uh, trimming a foot with this, and it makes it much, much easier on the horse and yourself. Uh, Jan Fabecki is from Danbury, Connecticut. That's him in the center with Dave Farley and, and, and Brian Quincy. This is uh, typical of the, another of the little trailers that are, are being set up where they kind of are color coordinated with the cars. Uh, typical of, of, of how they are, are set up as far as uh, very typical. Most of these, these are set up with, on, on the right hand side with all of the tools and the, uh, the drawers and everything on the back and uh, inventory on the left. Uh, again, he uses the uh, two or three anvil. Uh, another beautiful barn. These, these barns are just one right after another, just nicer than the next. Uh, John is a little bit different in the fact that he doesn't have princess service uh, for his horses, uh, with the grooms bringing the horses and taking them away. In fact, in fact he actually insists on, on getting the horse out of the stall himself. That his uh, his premise is that when the horse steps from that soft stall onto that hard uh, aisle, if he's sore at all, John's going to be able to see it. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a whole lot better knowing that before you take that shoe off, you get this whole thing started rather than uh, detecting any kind of soreness on the, on the, on the, when the horse is all finished. Uh, this horse here was a, kind of a mild club foot. I did, this, is about, this is the only horse I remember seeing that, that actually had a club foot. And, and uh, this is a, the trimming technique that you need to do on these club foot that you need. It's called the rotation. And you, you do not trim the, uh, the foot all the way from the heel to the very front of the toe, but uh, you can kind of see where the, uh, the old plane used to be and, and, and where the new one is. Uh, when John's going to shoe this horse now, he's going to take this, this comfort shoe and he's going to set it back to the, uh, to the new plane and he's going to take and rasp that, 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 that dish out of that foot. And uh, that's a way to control these feet. And uh, it, it's always, these things are always a maintenance problem, and they, they, but this is the proper way of doing it. I was really impressed with, with John's uh, concern for safety with the full face mask, the hearing protectors, and, and the breathing mask, uh, especially when you're grinding these aluminum shoes. 
um, that that aluminum particle dust gets in the air, and you really want to don't want to be breathing that stuff. Uh, John is really an innovative guy. That uh, he uh, he's taken one of the reins of his uh, his pullers and made it into a hoof pick. And so as soon as he's got that shoe pulled off, and rather than having to grab him a hoof pick, he's got it right there, and he can clean it out. I thought that was a nifty idea. Uh, this is a rail shoe that that John said he's had on three different horses with uh, with very very good success. For any time you kind of need uh, to get those heels elevated, uh, you, you can put this on and they can break over both direct, all all directions uh, very nicely, except for the for the rear. And uh, and then you kind of let the foot settle to uh, calm down, and uh, you can put them back in the regular shoes. Uh, this is another shoe that he's made up. This is for a uh, collateral ligament tear. Uh, the theory behind this is on the on the side where you have the tear, which you want it to do is is uh, is make sure that 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 side doesn't uh, sink into the ground. And so this is a real easy way to make one of these shoes to fabricate. I think it's made out of an SX-8, and they just weld additional material to that inside, and grind that inside branch off, and uh, make makes a very very useful shoe. Uh, this is typical of John's hind shoes. He has his shoes uh, a little maybe rounder on the toe than, than Dave's. You kind of see he's got that little bit of a kick in the heels. Uh, this is uh, kind of made famous by Seamus Brady. This is how you how you do that, and it, it opens the heels and. Uh, and gives it that little kind of that little extra flair to it. Um, I saw a lot of the guys taking uh, thinning the the, uh, the clips. Um, so when you take and uh, you uh, bring the clips back to the foot, they're going to move much much easier. He also has kind of a unique set of uh, fitting tongs. That what he's done is he has his his reins kind of set at a little bit of an angle, and he's got twists. And so when he when he sets that that foot on the uh, he sets that shoe on the foot to burn it on, uh, you don't have your hand in the way. Um, I saw a lot of veterinarians at the barn as well as it uh, with these guys, and um, the veterinarians treat the farriers as equal. And this was really gratifying to see that uh, I think our profession has finally come up a, a level, and uh, the cooperation between the vets and the farriers is absolutely outstanding down here. Uh, this is another technique that John uses for for clinching his hind feet. Um, getting that la those lateral nails on the hind feet is always a little bit of a of a, of a tricky. Uh, you have the option of getting under the horse, which is a little dangerous, or or being a contortionist from from trying to get it from the outside. Uh, this way here, what uh, what John does is he's kind of the, the best of both worlds, where you're supporting it with that inside leg, and uh, you've got a lot of uh, of uh, leverage and control to and, uh, to pull those clinches down from the outside. That, that's really a good good idea. Uh, sandy blocks are the most common uh, method for, for cleaning up these feet. Uh, just about everybody's got something different to put them on on them once you uh, once you have them cleaned up. That uh, John swears by this this miracle oil. Uh, another kind of nifty thing he's done is he broke the top off his uh, his foot stand and uh, and uh, the uh, was completely uh, the threads were pulled out and so he made a little. Uh, uh, mold out of a little Dixie cup, filled it up with the Vet Tech uh, hoof pack, and he says it, it, it works better than the original. Uh, this is an ingenious hospital plate that John uses that you can kind of see the little uh, two rivets in uh, at, at, the, at the toe and the heel there. Uh, what he does is he drills a little additional holes in there, and then the rivets are sticking up, and uh, the uh, the hospital plate is turned over, and and he uses those little uh, rivets as, as guides, and and so uh, he calls this the blind man's uh, hospital plate, where uh, even even a blind man can find those uh, those holes very very easily with this. It really works real well. Uh, also, a lot of the guys have rivets or excuse me magnets on their uh, on their aprons. Uh, this is also very common. Uh, I'd like to thank George Fitzgerald. Uh, George is one of my uh, my old friends. Uh, I met him probably 35 years ago. He was very instrumental in, in me coming to Florida and and, uh, and being a part of this whole thing. He uh, he works out of one of the uh, still no bodies. A beautiful beautiful truck. Uh, speaking of trucks, this is the largest shoeing truck I've ever seen. This is owned by Sean O'Neill from New York. It's a uh, great big uh, Mercedes. Um, Arnie Gervasio is, uh, is probably the busiest horseshoer on the ground. That's Arnie in the center with uh, with Tim and, and Eric. Uh, they were working in a beautiful, beautiful barn. They work at, at three horses at a time. Uh, this barn has all the all the toys. Arnie works out of this tag along trailer uh, that's uh, that's beautifully set up. Um, and this is Eric's rig. Eric is six four, and so he's able to to reach all of this this uh, stuff quite easily. 
Arnie has uh, his trailer set up with uh, two grinders that's a different different grinding stations. This is the old jet that uh, that was very very popular years ago. We don't see those too much anymore. Uh, they've been re totally replaced by the ball doors. Uh, this was an ingenious idea that uh, I thought that, that Arnie uses that he has a shop vac set up with his uh, his grinder and so when you start the grinder and you, st and you start the shop vac all of that dust and debris and everything is sucked right up into the vacuum cleaner and keeps your, keeps your, your trailer much much cleaner and keeps all that stuff out of the air. And you can also do the upper uh, uh, part of the photo there, they do the, uh, the fan uh, that uh, blows air down through the thing and makes it quite comfortable place to work. Uh, his drilling and tapping setup, everything is really, really nice and neat in this trailer. Uh, this is a, a great addition to, to any any. Trailer. This is a, a Milwaukee portable bandsaw. Uh, Stone Mill makes these things. Um, I've used one for a number of years, and you'll uh, you'll wonder how you ever did it without them uh, once you once you get one. Totally recommend uh, buying them. Arnie has a. a welder and uh, generator set up in the front of his truck and so he can um, shoe horse in the middle of a 40 acre pasture if, if necessary. Uh, these Jackson pad cutters are very very common down here too. Uh, people really seem to like them as well as these uh, these Emerson anvils. Uh, this is a swan anvil that uh, that Arnie has also. This is a this is a stout little rascal. It weighs probably about 110 pounds or so. Has a wide face, and uh, Arnie has taken and modified that that horn. I uh, made it a little bit longer than tipped it up. And uh, uh, I've seen other people do that, and it's, I think it's, it's a good idea for a horn. Uh, in addition, he has a, a stall jack and a smaller anvil up uh, be, between the horses at the front, so he doesn't have to be continually running back to the trailer if he wants to make a little bit of a modification. Uh, Arnie asked me to take this picture. He made this hoof stand uh, 35 years ago and has used it continually, as well as the, uh, that's his original quench pail. It's an old cream can. Uh, these, these grinding sta uh, stations used to be very, very common down here. Uh, Arnie's got one of the last to use one that I, that I saw. Um, the problem with this is that you use a hand grinder with it and you spray sparks all over the place and uh, you have to be really, really careful where you use them. Here Arnie is using a towing knife, uh, which is he's one of the few guys to use one down here. Uh, he uses his for on, on horses that have really extremely hard frogs. And here these things are used to, to trim the entire foot when not even using a nipper. Uh, here's a scene from the back of the trailer with the, everybody working, everybody busy and happy. Um, this is the classic roller shoe. Arnie likes this shoe a lot, especially with this, this kind of a setup here with a, uh, a wedge uh, rim pad. Uh, this is typical of, uh, of of Arnie's work here. You can kind of see all of that uh, uh, that heel support back there, uh, and and uh, the shoe is set back just a little bit. Lots of lots of coverage at these heels. This would keep these horses sound. Uh, this is the classic support. Uh, Arnie likes a shoe for horses, especially with round feet. This thing comes with uh, already drilled and tapped. Uh, comes with a toe clip and. Uh, he said this a lot of, lot of these shoes will just, just strap right on a foot, just really, really nice. It makes for a beautiful shoe. Uh, this is Arnie's hind feet. Uh, this is Dr. Alan Ray, who was working at the uh, the barn that day. I asked him about what, what he recommends for horses with these negative palmer angles, and he said that he recommends the uh, the flip-flop shoe. He said you put these on for uh, one or two shoeings, and that heel will rehabilitate very, very nicely. You can put them back in the regular shoes, and it's a, it's a very, very good product. Uh, this is what's called a suspensory shoe. It's a little bit controversial. The uh, theory behind this thing is that a horse with a weak suspensory, you don't want to, uh, to have that elevated uh, um, foot. So I'll tell you what you want to do is you want to keep that, uh, that toe from coming into the ground. And so that, that piece of the uh, that toe will keep the, uh, the foot on top of the ground and the, the penciled heels will allow it to sink in, thereby transferring the, uh, the pressure to the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, the way you make these is you generally either use quarter or three sixteenths by one stock. Uh, Arnie's got that welder right there, and so he can weld it in. And so what, what this shoe is is effectively it's, it's not a toe weight shoe, but uh, uh, some some people believe that it works. Some people doesn't. Well, I guess the test of time will see whether it'll it'll be here on for for a while or not. Uh, one of the horses he shot with this thing had a little, had pretty much of a of a cuppy frog, and so they filled that in with the uh, the hoof pack to keep it from from being packed up. Uh, this is typical of, uh, of, uh, of 
using the calipers. Um, I saw a lot of people using calipers for, for measuring tow lengths and uh, make sure they were equal. I did not see a single hoof cage in, in use. Um, TJ Jones uh, lives here in uh, Loxahatchee. Uh, TJ is as well as the rest of these guys have shod all of the best horses uh, in, 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 the, in this country for a number of years. He works out of this uh, well, well-fitted uh, gooseneck and here he is uh, at his anvil drawing those clips out. This is one of his neat ideas. I thought that uh, there are a number of uh, gravel roads, actually they're sand roads down here, and they, they're like washboards and they're really, really hard on your liners and your forge. So what he did is he put these little springs uh, on the bottom of his forge and uh, that absorbs a lot of that, uh, that shock, makes your liners last much, much longer. Uh, another nifty idea is on the side of his forge are these big magnets, so you uh, it, uh, when you close the thing up, it makes a really effective closer. Uh, typical of the, the drilling and tapping setup, uh, the way he's got his bell door set up and uh, for drilling and tapping. This uh, TJ made this uh, foot vise years ago, and it is probably the best foot vise I have ever seen. It's the strongest one I've I've known about. But what he does instead of a, a spring with with normally with what you see on these things is he's incorporated a little bottle jack. And so you can pump this thing up, and I don't know how much how much pressure you can exert on, on those jaws, but you put a shoe in there, and that thing is absolutely not going anywhere. Um, I'm kind of surprised that this hasn't been uh, somebody hasn't taken this idea and run with it and, and made these commercially because it's uh, it's really really a good way to, to secure a shoe. Um, this is not TJ's work. This is a horse that, that just arrived from Europe, and normally these horses used to arrive from Europe with big 12 uh, millimeter by 25 millimeter shoes, great big old clips, uh, great big clinches. I mean, just really kind of ugly looking shoes, and uh, they have really kind of done a turnaround that we pull the shoes off, and and these are this horse could have could have been shot here in the United States, and so it's it's kind of interesting to see that the Europeans are starting to uh, adopt some of our shoe shoeing methods. Uh, this is a, the finished job that the TJ has. Um, beautiful, beautiful work. He also has one of the most uh, unique shoeing box on the grounds. Uh, this little giant foot is is uh, is is really really cute. Uh, Again, with the uh, the use of the, of the clever use of the magnets, he also uses this uh, um, this uh, almost looks like a file it's made by Viking Farrier Tools. It's abrasive uh, paper on the sun side, and then you can take the uh, all of the brass marks out of your feet and, and get a really really a smooth finish. Another thing that he uses is a little mini leaf blower to clean out his trailer. But he's very fastidious with his trailer, and this thing really uh, keeps it really clean. Ira Green is uh, another uh, old timer down here with his uh, associate Brandon Lee, another of the typical Florida barns that they, they work in. They work at uh, two horses at a time. Ira uses a, a, a trailer also, uh, set up uh, similar to uh, to John's with the Future 3. Uh, really good idea down here is that when on these, these grinders, uh, these shoes will get really, really hot quickly, and so it's good to have a little bit of a punch pail right handy and uh, cool these things as you go. Uh, this is Ira's uh, setup for his grinder. This is a, a stone wheel, uh, and so what he uses that for is when he's uh, notching out his clips. Uh, he uses that rather than the nipper and does it very, very uh, accurately. And then on either side of the, the stone wheel, he's got uh, discs uh, for opening the insides of his, of his uh, heels uh, on, on his shoes. And that also really, really works well. Um, this is a great way to have your forge set up down here with the, with the heat. Uh, what, it transfers all of that heat up, up through the, uh, the chimney and out, out the top and, and not into your face. Um, so all different kinds of boxes. This is a Cobra box uh, that's uh, very, very common down here. And uh, I'm not sure who makes this one. It's kind of like a little spider box. But, uh, I saw a couple of these in use and uh, I thought they were kind of unusual. Uh, I want me to get a picture of, uh, of, his, of his hammers. Uh, the one on the left is an uh, old one ear that he's had since his beginning of his career. He kind of keeps that for uh, nostalgic reasons. And the one on the right is a Tom Hall hammer that one of his, uh, his protégés uh, got so enamored with that, he, that uh, I would promise to leave it to him with his will. Uh, the use of egg bar shoes down here used to be really, really common. And uh, I only saw this one horse uh, the entire week. Uh, using egg bars. They've really kind of gone out of style. Um, 
this one here is set up with a, with a rim pad. And Ira had a kind of a nifty idea of, uh, of, uh, of cutting out that center of that pad. What he does, does is use uh, WD-40 to spray the leather right around the perimeter of that, that shoe. And then this is a tile cutter and it, that, uh, that really softened that leather up and it really cut very, very easily. Another thing that, uh, that Ira does and, and some of the other shoers is to soak those leather pads for probably about five minutes. And so then when you put it on the foot, that, that leather will compress and so your, your clinches will, will stay tight and not pop up when that, that leather gets a little soft and, uh, and a lot of the nail heads to come up. Uh, another, this is uh, Iris finish down here. And this is, uh, this is his sign shoe. He blunts his shoes just a little bit more, maybe has just a little bit more heel length and some. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful shoeing job. You can see how much uh, caudal support there is on these feet. Uh, this is a little, uh, this is a large pony foot here. Uh, the outside heel and the inside heel. You can see everything is, uh, is there's plenty of expansion there. Everything is, is safed off very nicely. And then the front foot here with a little aluminum shoe. Uh, this is what Ira likes to put on his feet to, uh, to finish them off. Uh, we'll go to Sandy and Joe Johnson and Ben McIntosh again here in Loxahatchee. Joe and Sandy are a husband and wife team. They've been around for a long, long time as uh, Ben is a new associate. Uh, this is typical of the older barns that uh, that used to be uh, common uh, in our surpassing now by the uh, by the McMansion barns. Um, this is an Omni van that uh, Joe and Sandy had. This used to be the state of the art rig uh, 20 years ago. Uh, Joe and Sandy have survived all the time because they've taken such good care of it. Uh, they're very, very nice, nice rigs, and they kind of see everything pulls out. Uh, the, Got, got plenty of, of shade, uh, plenty of room in these things. Uh, Joe carries his anvil underneath there, and uh, beautiful, beautiful rig. Uh, this is a Future One anvil. I, these used to be real popular years ago. Joe has uh, modified his a little bit with that horn. Uh, they got a, a air compressor there to keep everything clean. Uh, the fan to blow on you when you're when you're working. Uh, the Miller welder for for any kind of welding needs, and the uh, inverter for working uh, when you don't have electricity. Now they have a distinct uh, division of labor where uh, Eric or um, Ben does all uh, the pulling and clinching, and he trims and, uh, and chews the hind feet. Uh, Sandy does the front feet, uh, the trimming and, and the nailing, and uh, Joe is the fireman. He shapes all the shoes. Um, here he's been clinching. This is also kind of a nifty little. This is called a precision pick. And I've seen uh, some of the guys use these things. What you can do is you can use it to judge the. the the heel depth of these things and uh, and kind of get a measurement. Also has a measurement on the, on the front as far as you can use it like a as a, as a protractor. Uh, they have their setup with a, uh, a wire wheel on one side and a, and a six inch uh, on the other. Um, these are the old Porter cable tappers. This 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 <laughs> this tapper has probably their old 10 million shoe air holes. And uh, this is Sandy working at the uh, uh, foot vice, uh, the, the method that they used for, for grinding. Um, then she finishes everything off on the, on the expansion wheel. Uh, this is a the seven inch Makita grinder fitted out with the uh, four and a half inch flat disc. Um, they finish their feet also with the uh, the rotary sander, and uh, you kind of see it does a beautiful, beautiful job. And uh, they, they like the hook the hoof shield. Uh, view of their uh, aluminum drawer, and you kind of see all the different kinds of shoes that they have, and uh, something for everybody. Uh, this is typical of, uh, of Joe's shoes here, and uh, you can see the, uh, the the roll on that toe there that's taken off to get that front edge off. Uh, this is a uh, an adult uh, jumper uh, that they were working on the day I was with them. Uh, you can kind of see he's got a little bit of a long toe. Uh, this, this is a hind foot here with the uh, the shoe kind of set out in front of them almost a little bit, and kind of a uh, a real pointy hind foot. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the before and the after. You can kind of see they blended that that toe up a little bit more, just a little bit more heel coverage. On the hind foot, they've really changed it where they've set that shoe back quite a bit more, taken off that that round toe, and uh, and uh, on, on the lateral side a whole lot more coverage. Uh, this is a uh, front and the hind. Uh, another thing that you should see a lot, and don't see too much anymore, is, is Ben is uh, putting on Venice turpentine. Uh, this seals the bottom of that foot up very nicely. There's all kinds of uh, 
the bacteria down here and uh, it's uh, this really beneficial in, in keeping uh, the bottom of the foot nice and healthy. It also uses a uh, synthetic hammer for uh, blocking and uh, the nails up here and uh, their, their theory is they don't want any uh, any board jarring of these, these sensitive feet than absolutely necessary. Uh, got to see uh, Aaron Gygax. Aaron used to work at Ridden Riddle years ago. He flew in all the way from, from Switzerland to do this uh, this set of horses. Um, kind of a nifty picture, I thought, of Aaron first thing in the morning. Uh, the, the assignment was they had something like 24 horses to do. They had uh, um, two days to do it, and so he enlisted the help of James Gilchrist here in, uh, in, in Florida and uh, his crew of three, that's uh, Jason, Ben, and, and Kim. And so I got to see this whole team of five farriers at once working uh, all together, and uh, it was a flurry of activity. Uh, the way they did it, this is the root and real truck on the left here, and, they, uh, and uh, James's uh, trailer. James got uh, two of these trailers, and so when he's working and doing their own horses, uh, lots of times he'll be working at one set of barn and his, uh, his associate will be working at another. Uh, typical of the setup of uh, this is the root and riddle truck. Uh, Kim uh, pulling here, she's from Upper Michigan and uh, and comes down for the winter to to work for for James and, and to learn does a does a very very nice job. Um, Aaron would work pr uh, primarily on on the front feet, and uh, these were all new horses that he was doing, and so the the protocol. Uh, for each of these horses, we'd take them out and we'd jog them on the uh, on the hard surface. Then we'd go to the ring and put them on the lunge line, and watch them go in each direction, uh, and bring them back in. If there were any issues, uh, the veterinarian was right there to take X-rays. And uh, before each horse uh, was was trimmed, he uh, went under the hoof testers and uh, a surprise at a number of issues that you found that uh, uh, that you really wanted to know about before you. Uh, Finished, uh, finished shoeing this horse. Uh, if you're going to buy any hoof testers, this is absolutely the best one on the market. I uh, saw a lot of pads put on that particular day. A lot of these horses had had soreness issues, and, and so uh, Aaron was 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 very busy putting on on pads. I saw all kinds of uh, a couple different ways of uh, of, of, of uh, packing the feet. Um, this is one of um, the methods that. Uh, Aaron uses this as a Kevin Bacon hoof solution uh, with sterile cotton. He said this is very, very popular in, in Europe. Um, other uh, methods, I, I saw that some of the other horses were, were filled with the Equithane hoof pack. Uh, both, all the, this is the, the French pad, and so you can see all kinds of variations. Um, I saw a lot of these. Uh, uh, this is the ACR shoe. Um, it comes with three clips, and so you can you can use a toe clip and, and cut off the side clips, or vice versa. Uh, it's got a lot of roll to it. It's 15 millimeters thick. Uh, Aaron used a lot of these shoes on his horses. Um, on this particular shoe uh, horse, they wanted to make a full support shoe, and so this is a Grand Circuit shoe that they they took and uh, and took the, the the bar out of. Um, did a very nice job cutting it out, and then uh, Aaron they. Uh, it's got a uh, the welder on this truck has uh, got a TIG uh, uh, welder and, and so he welded that in and this is the, the finished job and then they finished it off uh, this one here with uh, with the hoof pack. Uh, another thing that uh, Aaron routinely did on all of his horses is that he took and he gra uh, rasped those nail heads off and so uh, this was the, this is kind of the, uh, uh, the the issue of the too much uh, traction. And so he doesn't want any kind of, uh, of hindrance when that horse is going over the, uh, the, the jumps just to, to get those nails to grab and, uh, and, and, and stumble or whatever. You can kind of see here they use both uh, side clips and, and horses with, with toe clips. He also puts a lot of what we call mechanics on in these shoes. This is how much belly is, is in that shoe. And so consequently, the feet, instead of being uh, totally flat, have, have a little bit of a, of a high spot. Uh, that shoe on the top is a, uh, um, a, a flat shoe, and you can kind of see exactly how much mechanics is, is put in this, in this shoe. Here's Aaron uh, uh, sighting one out. Uh, he also likes the, uh, this, is, this is a real common nail here, the, uh, the Delta, the combos, and uh, this, is, uh, this is typical of the way they, uh, they nail horses in Europe. 
that instead of bending them over or wringing them off, what they do is they, they leave them sticking up and then stick them next to the foot. And so uh, you have to be really, really careful handling these, these feet because this is a, I, I can never quite understand the wisdom of that, but uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our, our time here, so I'd like to uh, uh, wrap this up. And uh, if we have any questions, we'll, we'll entertain them now. Okay, so we okay. got a few questions. I'll go ahead and read through some of these. And uh, uh, let's start off here, Red, with uh, here's a question from an hor a horse owner who's interested in uh, what are the dominant breeds that you're seeing now as hunters and jumpers down in Wellington? The um, years ago, the thoroughbreds used to dominate. That changed probably about 20 years ago, and so the uh, it, it almost exclusively warm bloods. Um, a lot of uh, the Dutch horses are very, very, very common. Uh, Cell Francais. Um, there, there are so many um, different combinations now that they, they are, that they're breeding in Europe, um, and, and so there's there's no one one particular. Uh, um, breed that, that dominates, but uh, the, the Dutch horses are, are, are probably the most numerous, and uh, and, and they, they, they've they done a wonderful job of breeding sport horses there in Holland. Okay. Now, you showed a lot of uh, horses that are getting ample heel support. Um, what are the guys doing to ensure that the shoes aren't grabbed from behind? Um, I should have gotten a picture. There, uh, there are a couple of products on the market uh, that that you can you can wrap around the. Uh, it almost looks like an inner tube that'll go around the the the, the, uh, the front of the horse's corner band, and then it wraps around at the heels. And and uh, those are very very effective in, in keeping your shoes, the front shoes, from being pulled off. Okay. Uh, with the aluminum shoes, and you're showing uh, the guys grinding. Do the ceramic belts get clogged? And if so, what are they doing to prevent the clogging of those belts? The the ceramic ones seem to to not not clog as much as some of the others because they're they're a little bit harder. Um, there also is a, a product. Uh, it's a wax that you can uh, that you can put on some of these uh, on a belt before you use it with the uh, for the aluminum shoes. And uh, but a lot of the guys that did not see uh, what what they did is they they use they use the belts up and then then just replace them. Okay. Now you showed uh, some vet tech products being used. Are vet tech pore pads in use at all? Um, meaning that you also showed the Equipax being used under the pads, but have you seen it used as a pad? While I was with these guys this past week, I did not see a single soft pore. That there are some vets in the area that are very, very uh, pro soft pores, and so I've heard, I've talked, I've heard the guys using them, but uh, I, I did not see any of the in a single one the entire week. I think that has changed a little bit now with this footing. The footing is better and the horses uh, don't quite throw up. Um, possibly later in the season as the horse uh, horse show goes on, I think you may be probably seeing more and more soft horses uh, as the horse have become a little bit more foot sore from, from just wear and tear. Yeah. During that 16 week season, how many farriers are you seeing down there? It's really hard to tell because everybody is all over the place. Uh, we've got Roughly 10,000 horses in the area. Um, I I would say there's probably in the area of, of four or five hundred different shoers and uh, floating around here at any given time. Okay. Okay. Here, let me combine a couple of questions we have here. Uh, one is from a horse uh, horse showing school student who wants to know about um, a good way of going to line up an apprenticeship down there, and somebody else uh, who's an established shoer wants to know the best way to get started shoeing uh, in the Wellington area. This is a very, very hard place to break in uh, as far as getting customers on, unless you, uh, you're, you're already an apprentice or associate with somebody, uh, simply because of the fact that uh, these people are down here. They have very, very expensive horses. Uh, they came down here to win, and, and, they, and they're very reluctant to, to turn over uh, the shoeing to, to somebody who is, doesn't have a proven track record. And so uh, you have to do what I did years and years ago is you have to come down here and you have to stay. You're not going to do it in one season. You're going to have to come down here and, and get to know the people, and it may take two or three years to, be, to be, become established and, and kind of known. But, uh, but the first thing you have to do is get on the airplane or get, get in your truck and, and, and come here and, uh, and, and start networking. And uh, it, it's a great, great bunch you guys that they're all willing to help and as long as you're sincere and uh, and, uh, and and really serious about this there there's more than, than enough help okay uh, a couple people I have asked this uh, what's what's about an average price for maybe a, a four round shoe shoeing job there uh, probably three hundred and fifty dollars um, 
I have heard of you know some of these specialty things getting up into the four figures, and so uh, the the thing down here is that they it's it, this is a, a fairly expensive place to live you know and and uh, but the the price of shoeing down here is probably the, the highest in the nation. Thank thanks uh, in large part to uh, to Shavis Brady. Okay, let's see here. Uh... Oh, could you tell us a little bit more about the pads, uh, about why leather is preferred over plastic, um, especially considering the conditions? And, and you mentioned earlier, especially at the wash stalls, of how much, how much moisture these horses are, are encountering. Uh, concussion down here is, is, a, is a big thing, and, and a lot of the guys have kind of just come to the conclusion that the, the, uh, the leather pads are a little bit softer, and so consequently... Uh, uh, it does not uh, crush the heels quite so much. The 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 uh, the leather pads will actually crush before the the heels will. And uh, there's the uh, the the thing about uh, the breathability of the uh, of the leather, where the the leather does not quite seem to trap the moisture underneath that that foot so much, and uh, and consequently the the foot can uh, be a will be a little bit drier and harder when when you pull that that shoe and pad off. Okay. Is there a big problem with white line disease uh, down in that, that region? And if so, um, what do they treat with the foot after derivement? Um, I did. I, I saw one pony down here that uh, I'm not quite sure where it came from. But yes, down here in the, in the, in the south, uh, white line is, is a big problem. Um, with, with these horses that they have such uh, frequent good care that uh, any kind of white line issues are, are quickly, quickly uh, dealt with. Um, well, when when you do have a, a horse with, uh, it, and I I, I, regret, I think that's that's a, not a good thing to call it. It's a white line. It should really be called stratum medium disease. And and the way to deal with that is to to take and open the foot up to air and uh, and, and and treat it topically and, and let it dry out. And uh, that, that 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 could be a whole other subject for for another webinar. Sure. All right. Um, now you showed a lot of neat ideas, like how guys are using tools. Uh, from your experience of going to Wellington and coming back home here in Wisconsin, is that the kind of place where you're going to see innovations and approaches to shoeing that uh, here's a farrier that that's shoeing some uh, you know lower level hunter and jumpers that that might work its way down down to uh, other areas in the U.S. Um, it, 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 I don't I don't quite understand the question. Well, I guess are, are you seeing a lot of innovation in shoeing styles? Uh, you know that that are there because of it being a high-end market uh, that yes. might might make its way elsewhere into the U.S. Yes, definitely. I, these these guys down here are, are all that work together. They, they've been chewing together for, for lots of uh, time and, and uh, the clients go be, uh, in, in, you know, between farriers and so um, go, a good idea is just quickly picked up and, and the, the standard of the shoeing is, is so high down here that, uh, yeah, and so this is a really, really good place to come and, uh, and, and see what the top end guys are they're doing. And that, that's what I did, and it really, really helped in my business uh, when I was first getting started. Have you seen many bar shoes being used on the hind feet there? I did not see a single one, no. No, that, that, um, again, the, the, the egg bars used to be real popular years ago, both front and hind, and uh, that has seemed to have gone out of style. Okay. Uh, going back to the flapper shoe you showed, could you discuss a little bit more about that and its use? Um, what it is is that you um, uh, you have to take and cut a, a shoe in, in half at about the, uh, the third nail hole, and then the shoe is nailed on the, the front half of the foot, and the back half where they, it's, a, it's a thick uh, uh, pad, and, um, and and that is actually free to, to move up and down, and so there's 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 no um, direct hard contact with the heel that the heel is allowed to kind of almost like float, and, and so it it looks like it would not work, and and I was dubious when I first saw it and, until I saw the results of it, and uh, it is uh, it, it is it's a good good pad. Okay, okay, we got time for one last question. Uh, let's go with this one. Uh, with the high heat in Florida, do you have problems with dry, cracked feet? And if so, do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with it? And do you find that hot shoeing accentuates that problem? Um, cracked feet in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, like, 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 um, like, like a horse on pasture, no, that, that these horses' feet are, are tended to by the, by the best grooms in the country. And, and so um, 
they, they know how to take care of feet. And, and so, no, we, we don't see that. And as far as the, uh, as the hot fitting, um, I, I totally endorse it. It, uh, it, it, uh, it does seal those tubules up, and it, it's like anything else. If it's done properly and, and done well, it's, it's, it's beneficial. If, it, if it's not, then, uh, then it may have problems. But uh, all of the steel shoes I saw down here were, were hot fitted. Okay. All right. I lied. Let's get one more question. Um, you showed uh, a lot of keg shoes. Does anybody uh, use handmaids? I have not seen a handmade shoe on a uh, high-end jumper in years. Uh, it used to be that years ago, before all of the, uh, the good shoes were on the market, uh, it was necessary to make the handmade shoes. But now there are so many quality, well-made shoes that are, that are of, uh, of, of different types are available that 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 necessity is no longer there, and so uh, they they had the it, it, it's so time consuming making uh, handmaids, and and unless you do it on a regular basis, um, very often the result is not not going to be good, and so you are much much better off using these these well made uh, manufactured shoes.